the beauty of the Catholic Church. Welcome everyone to Polypat. I'm Eric Robinson from Polycarp's Paradigm. This is Pat Flynn from the Pat Flynn Show. Always a joy to be talking with you. Yes, yes. And I'm so excited. You know, last week, um, at least I aired um, on my podcast, our Black Lives Matter conversation. And we had talked about, let's do something joyful. You know, there's so much bad news in the world. There's so much going on. Let's do something life-giving and joyful. Yes. And yeah. I had an awesome encounter with a friend um, this week who really encouraged me to share the beauty of the faith and what I personally love about Catholicism. And he's a Protestant and he, rather than hearing arguments about or defending the faith in certain ways, which is sometimes certainly appropriate and something Pat Pat and I have done and love to do, we thought, you know what, let's share the beauty. Let's share what we actually just from our own, what we just love about the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And I hope you all get a lot out of this because if you're not Catholic, then maybe these are things to consider of like, huh, I didn't know that that's what that was all about, or I didn't know that it could be that beautiful or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you are Catholic, maybe this will bring some awe and wonder into your Catholic life. And, you know, you can share that with others. Like, I think it's so important to share what, what do we love when people are in love with a person, they tend to share it. When they when they see a beautiful sunset, they are like, "Hey, come and see this." Mm-hmm. When we fall more in love with Jesus and and the church he established with with the Catholic Church, then man, like that love can't help but explode into our into our friendships, into our lives. And that's what excites me about today's conversation. I, I agree. You know, beauty is inherently magnetic. And just a little backstory, I think you know most people probably think of my conversion as being largely philosophical and intellectual but i am i'm a man of of great emotions of uh, i i adore the beauty of the catholic church in so many ways but this was especially important for my wife's conversion and i got her to sit down and i was sneaking off to mass uh because she was ardently anti-catholic but i eventually got her to sit down and watch the catholicism series with me from bishop robert Barron. And he's a big proponent of ang- angling in with beauty, I think is how he would describe it. You kind of angle in with beauty just to get people to, to appreciate the church in, in its full majesty, apart from the technical arguments like you've been talking about, which, which for some people can be, can be off-putting for various reasons. I agree. And that really broke down all the stereotypes and caricatures she heard of the church. It then, she then became at least open to considering mm. it. So I think there's real value in that, the angling in from beauty. I don't think you can leave it at that. I think you ultimately need to consider whether or not it's true, but beauty can, it can help with the will, if nothing mm-hmm. else. And it can help break down misconceptions. And certainly this is true for me. I, I, I'm in complete awe of the Catholic, whole Catholic history of beauty, whether it's mm-hmm. the beauty of the sacraments, the beauty of the, of the liturgy, the beauty of the prayers, the beauty of the architecture, the beauty of the arts, the beauty of the music. I mean, there's Mm. so much to be in awe about the beauty of the Catholic church. I know we're just going to go, go through it kind of point by point here. Hopefully this won't be a five hour episode. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I didn't write down anything in advance when you, when you pose this subject, I'm like, all right, let's go. Just hit the mics and (laughs) uh, I'm sure we won't have any issue filling the airways, but I appreciate this because we spent a lot of time, Maybe on, you know, in some of the philosophical or theological weeds. So I think it'll be good to just zoom out and just, this will be personal. This will be experiential of things that have affected us. And I'm, I'm, looking, for, I'm looking forward to hearing your accounts yeah. of this. Um, so yeah, where, where do you want to begin? Well, as an ENFJ on the Myers-Briggs, I'm a J, so I did create a little list of things that I love. And, you know, this just struck me. I mean, it always strikes me, um, especially in the mass when we're all kneeling. And then when I, you know, what, here's, here's the, what I'm getting as the beauty of the people, the humility that I see in the Catholic church is just awe inspiring to me. And not, that's not to say every person that's Catholic is humble or, or anything like that. But what I see, I see this in the mass and I see it, especially in Eucharistic adoration as well. When I see a family that is going down the aisle about to go into their pew and they kneel uh, and genuflect. Um, 
and make the sign of the cross, you know, whether it's uh, the mom or the dad and then the little children as well. I just get so much joy from seeing a family that are, that they're, you know, they're bowing before the altar where the Eucharist will be, where Jesus will be. They're, they're genuflecting before Jesus in the tabernacle. They're, they, they're showing their kids that this is the faith. This is the faith that has been passed down to us. And just the childlikeness that it takes, you know, it, it's so funny with Catholicism, it has a span. Like, it, you know, the goal of course is to become a saint and there's saints that were little kids. There's saints that were great intellectuals. We're all called to have childlike faith and also press on to know God more. And I love that. Like we ultimately, we have to have some sort of childlike faith that when Jesus says, this is my body, we believe it. And when you embrace that childlike faith, then you can dive into the mystery of it and be amazed. Mm -hmm. But it's that childlike faith, not childish, but childlike faith. And just like the humility that I, I, I see. I mean, I was in Eucharistic adoration the other day and this lady came up to me um, right before adoration. She was trying to get perpetual adoration at the parish that I was going to. And her name was Maria. And she just had such a sweet and humble spirit about her. Like, oh, I just want people to adore Jesus. Mm -hmm. I just want people to adore him. And it's just like, and seeing people kneel and just look at Jesus in the blessed sacrament. And it just, oh, I get so overjoyed with the humility. And it reminds me of the humility of God, that God humbled himself and became man. And he still humbles himself under the appearance of bread and wine so that we might see him, that we might be in his presence, so we might partake of him and have a friendship with him. And I, I want more humility in my life all day, every day. And I think it, it requires a certain degree of humility to, to be Catholic. And I, I mean this on multiple levels. Like, you know, we're not all called to be a certain part of the body of Christ. We all are different parts of the same body and we all have equal dignity, but different roles. And so we're not all called to be the apostle Peter. We're not all called to be the apostle Paul. We're called to imitate them, of course, and, and in so doing imitate Jesus, but we have different functions. And so it's, it's actually liberating to me to that. I don't have like the weight of Pope Francis on me or the weight of the Bishop or the weight of even the priest. Like I have my own role as an evangelist or as just a, a student of the faith as someone who's just a lay person trying to be faithful and it actually takes a lot of pressure off and it's humbling and beautiful. So that, that was what I want to start off with, just the humility I see that I love. So I'm going to, my first point will tie into the humility and it's going to sound maybe a little controversial or contrarian at oh. first. I love the authority. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love, and that's, I, the reason I say it's going to sound contrarian is authority in our modern context has a very has sort of a negative connotation, doesn't it, right? And certainly as a, as a kid, you know, I was the rebellious teenager, right? I was the libertarian, you know, hard rock teenager who just like, if anybody would have thought that the words, I love authority would come out of Pat Flynn's mouth, they would have <laughs> laughed themselves to sleep. I would have laughed myself to sleep. So what do I mean by that? That authority is a beautiful thing when it's the proper authority, when it's the right relationship to authority. And we see it in the family structure. That when that I have a certain authority over my kids, and that as long as I am a loving, serving leader, and loving meaning that I'm willing the good of my kids, and I'm putting their best interests always in mind, even in, even to the point of sacrificing myself for their best interests, which a father should always do for both the, for his entire family, then if the kids respect my authority on that, especially on issues that they're unsure about or they haven't learned about in their moral development and their intellectual development. Everybody benefits from that. Everybody benefits from that. When I fulfill my proper role as a leader and they fulfill their role as my children, that authority is a very healthy thing. It's a very nurturing thing. Um, now, of course, that requires both sides fulfilling their, their obligations, right? Um, if I were to be abusive, then I could be abusive with that authority and that would be a misuse of authority and it would not be, it would not be fruitful. But same thing, if I am a good leader and the kids don't, you know, the South Park terms, respect my authority, <laughs> but it's bad for them. It's bad for their development. They're, they're frustrating their own good. So I think once you have a proper and healthy notion of authority, um, we can then approach the Catholic church. And from the fundamental Catholic 
belief that this is God's church, that it's ultimately God who's in charge here, that God guides his church. He, he provides that special charism to the church, the infallible magisterium, that the magisterium cannot err in matters of faith, moral, or sacraments. We have an infallible authority that is meant to guide us in the good life. And, and this is a beautiful thing because it means God isn't asking the impossible of us. God isn't asking us to figure anything out that he isn't already actively teaching us, making readily known through his church. God isn't asking us to save ourselves, to, be, to earn eternal friendship and salvation with him. He's giving us everything. He's giving us all the intellectual bounds we need. He's giving us the spiritual graces we need. And once you understand that, it's so freeing. It's so one, I, I love, and this I think will sound ironic because everyone knows how much I love philosophy, but I love that I don't have to figure everything out on my own. Yes. Because I would go insane. Right. I would go insane. But God isn't asking that for us. He's provided an epistemological mechanism. He's given us the church to guide us in faith, to guide us in morals, to guide, mm. to give us the sacraments, to give us the graces. Everything we need for our eternal flourishing and salvation is right there. And all we really need to do is just be receptive, is just cooperate with God's grace, understand the proper relationship to authority, and enjoy it. Yes. That's the love. Enjoy it and celebrate it. So yeah. once you, I think once you see authority in that perspective, it's hard not to see it as beautiful. It's a loving authority. It's authority there for our own good and can only be there. For our own good. It's not some arbitrarily oppressive regime. It's there because God loves us so much that he wants us to have the assurance. He wants us to have his grace always on hand. Everything, everything that we need, always ready, always there. And that to me is not only something that's so incredibly beautiful, but something that just excites me to mm -hmm. no end, to just to yeah. relish in that yeah. and celebrate that. So that would be my first point. I love the authority. Yeah. Church. And I, I love that too. And that was something that definitely drew me into the church. And, you know, when I became Catholic, it was like just refreshing because it was a sense of, ah, I'm done. Like having to try to figure everything out. Like you said, like if I have questions, I know where to go. And you know, ultimately I trust, I, I trust that this is the church Jesus started and sustains with his own power. And like, that's so liberating. It's I agree. Like, I don't have to even question um, things that I really a actually had to wrestle with to become Catholic because I had to just know them and to, to, for me to be willing to become Catholic. But once you take that step, it's like, oh, ah. I don't the have church, to question the that anymore. Was, the church was right. Yeah. yeah and and like, I want to be very clear. This isn't fideism because I yeah. have argued and would continue to argue that if you push reason, as far as it can go, it's going to converge on Catholicism. And, right. you're, and you, will, you can realize mm -hmm. the broad strokes of, of both metaphysics and ethics from reason alone. Mm -hmm. And what will, I think, surprise you, as it surprised me, is that it's in perfect harmony with what the Catholic Church teaches. Yeah. Now, the Catholic Church might have specific content to clarify particular instances of ethical behavior or something like that. But I love the way my friend Tim McGrew puts it. Uh, you know, reason converges on Christianity, Christianity perfects reason. Now, I would, I would push that further and say reason converges on Catholicism. Catholicism perfects reason. So any of the things that the church teaches, say, on, on morality, you can, you can figure those out if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and do the work yeah. and push through with the metaphysics. But, but let's be frank. Most people, uh, even if they're capable of doing that, don't have the time. Right. Many probably don't even have the interest God knows that. So why would he ask the impossible? Why would he ask the impossible of us? Right. He doesn't. He gives us that. So that's part of what St. Thomas would say. This is why revelation was, was necessary, right? Yeah. Because even though we can figure out that, that you know, not just God's existence, but the truth of the natural law, God wouldn't expect us or everybody to have to be an Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's so utterly unreasonable, if not virtually impossible. Instead, God loves us so much, he wants to give us everything we need to have to, to live yeah. a good life. So it's not just, I just believe it because I, I believe it. It's, I have good reasons to believe that the church does have the authority of Christ. Mm -hmm. And once I accept that, then I can 
I can stew and I can push, I can push it, yeah. I can investigate it, I can verify it all I want, but at the same time, I can have that assurance, which is actually so liberating and so freeing to know that yeah. I can rest in this and I can, I can enjoy it also. Is what I think we're trying to ultimately get at. Yeah. So like for me, one of the things I absolutely love is the idea of mystery and the importance of mystery within our religion. So like all of the sacraments are called sacred mysteries, right? God himself is a mystery. Now this doesn't mean you can't know God. God is a knowable mystery. And so what I mean by this is like, okay, for instance, when I was becoming Catholic I really had to wrestle with the idea that the Eucharist is Jesus Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. And I had to like learn the reasons for and against and all that thing. And I was like really caught up in that. And, but eventually I embraced it because I saw the reasons and I was like, okay, this is true. Okay. So once you cross that line and I became Catholic, right? I don't have to question that anymore. I mean, I can, if I want to, I can, I can look at those reasons again and again and again, if I want to. But when you embrace the mystery of the Eucharist, now you're on a whole different trajectory of using your intellect. It's faith now seeking understanding. And so what I love about the Catholic Church is the contemplative life. That now that I know that this is Jesus, and although that is a, like a, appalling almost to my senses, because what I can see, taste, touch, it, it t- see, you know, I see, taste, touch bread, I see, taste, touch wine, but faith tells me it's actually the body of Christ. It's actually the blood of Christ. It's actually Jesus himself giving himself to me. Okay. So now that I know that I can, my favorite part of every mass is after I partake of the Eucharist, I kneel down and I close my eyes and I'm like, whoa, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ is in me. And now I've already embraced that. So now I'm like, what does that mean? Like, What? Like, and it catapults me to a whole new level of thought that I couldn't have achieved if I was still questioning, like, is this Jesus? Is it not? No, now it's like, boom, it is. And now it's like, whoa. And like, it just opens up a whole gateway to the spiritual life that was, if I'm still in that questioning phase still, which is necessary at times, it would hinder me from actually experiencing the life. And what I love most of all is I, I, what I do is I close my eyes and I Remember uh, John, the beloved disciple, at the Last Supper, he lays his head on the chest of Jesus, and he's the beloved disciple. So I, I envision myself doing that, and just this, just this most amazing intimacy as friends with Jesus. And it's like, I just take deep breaths, and I, ah, it's like every burden's lifted. It's like, and then I contemplate this, and I continue to come back to these mysteries, and I'm like, What? how can that be? And then I press on and it's like, it just doesn't end. That's what a mystery is. It's, you know it, but you're constantly knowing more of it. Just like God, you know, God, like at this point, I know God exists. And, but to know that he's father, son, Holy spirit, like, I know that's true, but now I contemplate it and I'm in it and I'm living it and I'm loving it. And so it's just like, and it never ends. And it's always like satisfying, but also gets you to hunger for more. Correct. And I love that aspect of it, the contemplative, yeah. mysterious life. I, I agree. And I think it's very important to get clear on what Catholics mean by mysteries. Mystery doesn't mean, again, it's not fideism. Oh, we don't know right. this is true. We just accept it on blind faith. But the mystery is something that we actually accept in many other aspects of life where we have good reasons to believe something, even if that something isn't fully grasped. Exactly. I mean, t- take certain aspects of physics, which would, would tell us that space is curved. And you're like, how is that? <laughs> right? Like that seems really mysterious, right? Yep. And it is really mysterious. And like, there's tons of argument in philosophy of science of like what that actually entails and what that means. But it's not like it's something that we just believe or assert blindly, right? There's steps and premises and other independent reasons of why we would arrive at a, at a mysterious conclusion. Same thing, right? There's certain aspects of God, like God being a trinity, three self-reflective acts of understanding sharing in one perfect and complete, all-powerful divine substance, right? And there's, there's analogies that we can get of this, even within our own consciousness, 
where okay there's there's sort of op opposing relations without real metaphysical distinctions for example like i am both experiencer and experienced in a perfectly simple transparent reality to itself Mys mysterious but i don't deny my own consciousness unless i'm a weird eliminativist or something like that <laughs> <laughs> so but and i have very good reasons to believe that i i exist right. and i am conscious in the way that i expect a lot of mystery there, no doubt, but I have good reasons to believe mm -hmm. it. Same thing, based off of God's revelation of himself, there's a lot of mysterious aspects to the Trinity. Nobody denies that. But we have really good reason to accept that the Trinity is true, that God mm -hmm. is a Trinity. So I just want to, because I think that's a mistake that, that people right. sometimes fall into. We accept the mysteries precisely because we have such good independent reasons to believe them, but there's always right. some aspects about them that we just can't fully grasp. Which is reasonable and, because we're finite and God's infinite. Correct. It, it would actually be mysterious if there weren't mysteries. Right. <laughs> and not just mysterious, it would be suspicious if right. there weren't mysteries, right? Yeah. Like we're talking about it, when any type of relation between finite bounded beings and unrestricted omnipotent being like if there's not some mystery there like we're not talking about god right like right. that's 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 what so many famous theologians said like as soon as you think you fully understand god you could be sure that you don't got it right <laughs> and yeah. and that's why in the great catholic tradition we have the sort of you know the ways of understanding god via negativa we can we can make deductions about what god is not and we have the analogous way we can kind of like we're really at the we really have to stretch language to try and understand gods. We have analogical predication, mm. but there's still tons of mystery there. Doesn't mean we can't know anything. We can know quite a bit, but there's always going to be a lot that we just, that just is beyond our finite limited capacities. Yeah. Um, like St. Louis de Montfort said, a uh, mystery in the Catholic church is a sacred thing that is difficult to understand. But, like Jesus himself is a mystery, right? Like we know he's fully God, fully man, according to our faith. Um, according to reason, we know that he just we that he existed, and even his, just his mere existence from reason is kind of a mysterious thing. Because like, why would this random guy from Nazareth, everyone's still talking about him today? That's kind of mysterious. But he himself is a mystery according to our faith. Like, but once you embrace like that knowledge, like we know according to our faith that Jesus is fully God, fully man. Well, you can't comprehend it though. Like you can't yeah. fully grasp it, like you said. Yeah but you can treasure it. You can ponder it in your heart. Like Mary pondered it in her heart and it just grows over time. Yeah. And it becomes like this amazing life giving source of beauty and goodness. And yeah. And you can take all the philosophical and theological stabs at it. You want, and people yeah. have, right. It's not like people don't try right. to figure this stuff out. People have tried for centuries. Right. And there's been a lot of really interesting philosophical and theological treatments on the Trinity, the hypostatic union transubstantiation. Yeah. So if you're interested in that, as I am, and I know Eric is, that's, that becomes a wonderfully enriching project, right. I think, to try and, and work that stuff out. And that's one of the other things I love about the Catholic faith. It never shuts down reason. Mm. It, it instigates reason. It encourages reason yes. in all different avenues. And that's, uh, I guess I'll kind of slide in my other thing. What I love about the Catholic faith is if you can just accept you know, a little bit of mystery up front, which you have good reason to accept, everything else makes sense everything else makes sense. Nothing will give you such a satisfying, uh, synoptic, interlocking whole of reality as the Catholic faith, soup the nuts. No other philosophy, no other worldview can do it. I assure you, I've tried. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Doesn't mean that you can get every other you know, answer, every answer you want about everything, but it makes sense. It's philosophically rigorous, philosophically defensible. It's where reason converges. So if you can just accept some of these initial mysteries, there's meaning and light and clarity mm. for everything else. And it's kind of the opposite where, say, you know, where I was formerly as like an atheist, it's like, okay, I want kind of like, so if you can, I would say this for, for Catholicism, you can kind of like accept some degree of mystery on like the fundamental layer of reality, which is God, which I would argue we have every good reason to believe in God's existence, uh, especially through phil you know, philosophical demonstration and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then you get this wonderful uh, nexus of explanation through the rest of the world where you can make a, a incredibly robust sense of, of life, of meaning, of consciousness, morality, all of it, right? Contingency, all the things we talked about before. Mm -hmm. 
before, as, as an atheist, you try to get rid of mystery on the fundamental level. You try to get everything down to, say, like particles, fermions and bosons, right? But then, so you try to get no mystery at the fundamental level, but then everything else is a mystery after that. Nothing makes sense after that. You can't make sense of consciousness. You can't make sense of contingency. You can't make sense of reality. And the whole, the whole worldview becomes, I would argue, utterly incoherent. Uh, and if not incoherent, then inconsistent. So that's actually something I love about the Catholic faith. We have good reasons to believe this worldview. And it's actually the, the amount of mystery, the amount of, if you want to call it spookiness, <laughs> it's the word that sometimes yeah. used, is so much less in the Catholic worldview than it is, I would argue, in a non-Catholic worldview. And people mm -hmm. might not agree with that initially, but I would say no. Um, that's true, <laughs> right? That's true. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it makes so much more sense. So if you're somebody that is seeking intellectual fulfillment, philosophical rigor in metaphysics, in ethics, in philosophy of mind, you're not going to find more satisfaction, I assure you, than you will in the Catholic faith. So I know we were trying to focus on the beauty side, not necessarily the argument sides, but for me, that's beautiful. Yes, yes. For that's me, that good. is that is yes. part of the beauty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then all, and then just add to that all the the brilliant minds that you'll never be able to exhaust a study of throughout the history of the Catholic Church. Oh. Another, that's another beautiful aspect for me. Yeah. So going along with that, like I totally agree. Like it's a holistic understanding of reality that really does make sense. Yes, it's full of these things that, you know, the fact that God humbled himself and became man, you can never exhaust contemplating that. That's what I mean by mystery. It's not that you can't know it's true. It's just that now that you know it's true, it's like, whoa, and you contemplate it, you ponder it. What I love though, as well as just the consistency. And, and Eric, just real quick, there's yeah. a difference between knowing that and knowing how. And I think yes. that's kind of the key distinction yeah. to make. We can know that without always knowing how. Exactly. Yeah. And what I love is the consistency from what I see in, in the Old Testament to the New Testament to present day, that it's just an amazing tapestry. It's an amazing picture. So like God calling forth the people of Israel, prefiguring the church, the church then grafting in Gentile and Jew into the visible body of the church. Then that continues. Like it's when Jesus ascended, he didn't just say, good luck boys. And he actually gave us the Holy spirit. He gave us the church. He gave us the scriptures. He gave us all of these things. Um, but he gave us the church and from the church came the, the formation of the scriptures from the church came these ponderings and these councils that ponder these mysteries. And it's like, the church herself, like Mary, is pondering in her heart these things that were given by Jesus. And it's just consistent. And yet it's like, it keeps going and developing. And, but it's always consistent. So what I see Jesus doing in the Old Testament, or what I see him doing in the New Testament, is layered with prophetic meaning from the Old Testament. It's all fulfilling all of that. And now it didn't just like, all of a sudden shut down or something. It's like, it's continued. And so what I love is this sense of like the torch that was passed from God to Abraham, let's say Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, who became Israel, Israel to Moses, Moses to David, David to um, Solomon and to the present day, uh, and then to Jesus. And then Jesus to the apostles is now passed down to the saints and the church that is still here. And so it's like this torch of faith that is continual and it's constant. And it's like, no matter how many attacks have happened on the Catholic church, Jesus' promise remains firm. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is a wise mother, 2000 years old. And I love the history. I love that even in the darkest moments of the church, you just see the imprints of the Holy spirit because the church in prevailed like and and it's kept the faith and that's the beauty it's like it's never changed its teaching it's developed it it's pondered it more but it's consistent and you can rely upon it and i just love that like the great commission go therefore make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son holy spirit teaching them to observe all that i've commanded you and i'm with you to the end of the age 
That is so true. The disciples did not fail to make disciples. Mm -hmm. And we have those documents and they're part of our church. We're a living community. We're connected in a very mystical and spiritual way to the saints that have gone before us. Correct. And so the apostle Jesus discipled the apostle John. The apostle John discipled Polycarp. Polycarp discipled St. Irenaeus and so forth and so on. And now I'm in that discipleship chain. And it's like, whoa, this is amazing. The torch has been passed to us. And now we do our best with it and we pass it on to others. And when we die, it'll still keep going until the end of the age. Jesus is with us. And I love being part of something way bigger than myself. Uh, with you a thousand percent. And I'll tie that into my, into my next point of passing it on to another uh, even more personal aspect for me, which is having this faith for my family. Mm. And, you know, so I came into the church, how long has it been now? Three, four years? Is it four or three? I, I forget. It's been, 2016 it's, it's, or 2017? It's, it's been a blur. And then my wife came in a year after me and she was baptized and, and, and confirmed. Uh, she was there, you know, uh, conversion of her, her heart, of course, beforehand, but just mm -hmm. the way the schedule and then we got all of our kids baptized. And our household, if anybody listening has been to my house, which would be very weird for most of you, since I don't know most of you, <laughs> but a few of them, you'll see that it's, it is, you, there's no way you're walking into our house and you don't know that we're obnoxiously Catholic. Wow. Like, obnoxiously. The paintings, <laughs> the rosaries all over the walls, the crosses, the crucifixes. <laughs> So our house is obnoxiously suffused with Catholicism, and it's just so beautiful. And it's not really obnoxious. I think it's, we have our mini shrines. We're having an enthronement on Friday. A uh, priest is coming to the for house. For the Sacred Heart. For the Sacred Heart, Jesus. yep, having an enthronement. Um, and the way this brings our family together is so beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. we pray uh, every night. We pray our family rosary. And everybody prays a decade, and it's 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 so adorable and, and beautiful, especially when like the four year old is you know she's she's doing the best she can, yeah. And, you know, little things like saying my will instead of thy will. We want to come back to thy will, and it's just it's so beautiful. Uh, wow, dang it, it's so beautiful to have that with your family. Um, mm. And and we've and like you said, like you know, so we go to we go to daily mass. We're starting to resume daily mass finally with the yeah. with the coronavirus, and just. You know, seeing my kids, we're that big Catholic family, hauling the kids in, right? Um, and, you know, they kneel into the pew, sometimes facing the wrong way, and they sign the cross the wrong way sometimes because they're yeah. two years old. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's beautiful to have these dedicated times uh, that for us, there's really hardly any division between faith and family. I say hardly because sometimes, you know, Christine just wants to go to adoration and have her time or, or I. But most of the time, most of what we're doing with faith, we do all together. As a family, mm. mass, prayers, adoration, we take the whole family to adoration. You know, many pilgrimages. We're in Wisconsin, which is fascinatingly the only uh, Vatican affirmed Marian apparition site in the United States is in Wisconsin, of all places. Wow. So having that, being able to go there, there's a place called, by us called Holy Hill. Eric, when you come out, I'll have to show you. It's just so beautiful. Wow. And having the, the, the deep history, having all of the Catholic faith for my family, the intellectual history, the philosophy, the theology, uh, and having kids, kids are natural philosophers and theologians. They ask the best questions, right? All the time, like deep eschatological questions, like philosophy of mind. Like, I think it was Mortimer Adler said that, you know, philosophy is really just revisiting all the questions that you asked as a kid that the adults told you to stop asking. And taking wow. them seriously again. And that's, that's really true. So I take that seriously. Like when my kids ask a question, I do my darndest to give them a good answer. And I, sometimes I'm stumped. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to research that for you. Wow. I'm going to try and, and figure that one out. Um, they stump me more often than my podcast listeners do. Wow. And, and then also knowing um, you know, how much we have to look forward to of, that we can, any trip we take, just we always get excited about the churches we'll find, the parish communities we'll find. Mm. Having the parish communities as well for the family, the other, fa the other Catholic families, the other Catholic kids, always doing something, always involved in different studies or other activities, just infused in the faith. So all of this is just a million different ways of saying I love what it gives to our family and how it binds our family together around something so core, so fundamental that we all love. And legitimately, our kids love going to mass. And we, we always, you know, ha try to get them to see the beauty 
and the joy in it. Never want mm-hmm. them to see it as just some tedious, monotonous. Because, and I think that comes down to the obligation Catholic parents have to like, kids are smart. You don't need to dumb stuff down right. for them, right? They're smart. You can teach them the fundamentals of the faith very early on. They get excited about it. Like Mira, yeah. my my four year old, she loves Saint Michael and the Saint Michael's prayer. She prays it all the time. She gets wow. pumped up and jazz. So it's it's cute just to see how, the prayers that all the all the kids like. And and I'm gonna let you go again, but my next point will tie into this, and that's both the unity and diversity within the Catholic Church. Mm. Universal faith, but how diverse the spiritual practices are. Yeah, for everybody, but that point that I want to make is what it has done for my family. Cause I had a family before we were religious and I know what that's like. I'm not saying yeah. it was bad. There was, there was a lot of love there. There was, but there was something so fundamental missing that yeah. now that we have that I will never ever um, lose that gratitude that I wow. have for that gift of faith for the family. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. And like I said, at the beginning, like that's such a joy for me, even as a single person to see these families at mass, seeing the kids do the sign of the cross and all of that is just like, ah, oh, it's so beautiful to me. It's mm-hmm. just such a joy. Uh, and, and, you know, speaking of the mass, one of my favorite things is when I experience a very beautiful mass. Like I think some of the best ones have been where incense is certainly involved. <laughs> yeah. And I oh, love the smell of incense. All the yes. physicality. I'm all oh. about it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, it just is sensory overload sometimes. And I love it. It's like engages everything. So we use our bodies to worship God, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? We kneel, we stand, we genuflect, we make the sign of the cross. We have incense. We bow at different times. We stand up for the gospel. We hear it. We're interacting with the, the priest. We're saying, and with your spirit and all these things. And and I just love it. And so you have this incense and you have my favorite ones have been where there's like a choir in the back that you can't even see. Mm-hmm. And it's just like angelic voices over your head to make you feel like what is actually happening, which is heaven's here. Mm-hmm. Um, so you feel like heaven on earth, like mm-hmm. this is heaven on earth. And, and that's what is happening. And so entering into the heavenly liturgy through the earthly liturgy is phenomenal. And man, when you really have a beautifully done sacred liturgy, it's just like catches you up and you forget the cares of the world, all the chaos and all these things for just a split second and you get refreshed and then you're able to go out refreshed and bring joy to the world Yes, and go into the messes and be a light. Um, But you need that time of refreshment of like, okay, God is transcendent and there is some something way bigger going on and I just got caught up in it. And this was awesome. Dude, so I, I wanna, just love that. I want to echo that. And we're fortunate to have a number of beautiful parishes around us, but one of them is, uh, does Latin mass, the extraordinary mm. form. And it's so freaking beautiful. <laughs> the choir is like a professional choir. And you know, if you've never been to a Latin mass, please go check it out because it's, it's, it's just so wonderfully extravagant. And, and sensory overload, right? The prayers, the and the like, the little gestures, like any time yeah. um, that the name of our Lord is said, there's always a slight bow, right? So like, you won't understand any of it at first, but that's part of the fun is you start to unpack the deeper meaning and see that everything has a meaning. Nothing is arbitrary, right? Um, it's so beautiful. I mean, so so we you know daily mass we go to the new mass, which I which I love. I love the new mass, uh, especially when it's done beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Sundays we try to get to the Latin mass, which is again just wonderfully extravagant, which just seems appropriate when it comes to God. Like yeah. I love, give me the extravagance. I yes. love it. I don't want. Yeah, I give like make We're it. We're in holy yeah. ground. Let's like, go. Yeah, one hundred percent. Don't tone it down. Tone it up. I'm all about right. that. Yeah. And then. We're going to Michigan here soon. Eric, we'll be meeting up in Michigan. Yes, actually. yes. I don't know when you're getting in, but we always go to uh, a church. If you're in, in the Ann Arbor area, check this one out. It's called Old St. Pat's. It's outside of Ann Arbor. It's one of the oldest churches, Catholic churches in Michigan. Now, it's a small, very small church, okay. but it's one of those beautifully minimalist churches. Wow. And beautiful choir. And their liturgy is actually an interesting blend between the new mass and old mass. I've never seen anything like it. So we always look forward to going to that church when we're in Michigan because it's just so wow. beautiful. The pews hurt 
because they're so old and wooden, but I love it. A little, uh, so, a little voluntary mortification going on there. <laughs> Uh, but the choir is beautiful. The yes. liturgy is so beautiful. It's it's just it's just so wonderful. So yes, you know, seek out a beautiful mass. You mm-hmm. deserve a beautiful mass. Demand a beautiful mass, and that's yeah, that's something you don't want to miss out on. And we're fortunate yeah. in our area that we've got a lot of good options for that. I know some areas maybe not be the case, but if you if you can strive to find a beautiful Orthodox liturgy, it's it's so yeah. transformative. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of hijacked yours, but I had another one. Yes, go go again. Yeah. Yes, go. The other one, I, I I love the I love I love our priests. I do. Mm. And let me start with the caveat that there's bad priests out there. There are terrible priests, and Catholics are aware of this. They're embarrassed by it. They're ashamed by it. And bad priests deserve to be punished and rooted out. But the vast majority of priests are good and holy men and have helped me in so many ways I can't Mm. even begin to explain. Two of the priests that really affected my conversion, and this will tie in the kind of unity and diversity, was one was a beautiful man, Father Wilfred from Africa. And And I love African priests. They're so joyful and they're so orthodox and they love chanting. And I saw this man's joy, this, this African priest, and he's got this beautiful accent. He was great at telling stories. He always had a huge smile on his face, and he was so unapologetic about preaching the truth and preaching the gospel. I'm like, whatever that guy has, I need it in my life, right? <laughs> yes. And, you know, and it's funny because the Catholic Church sends a lot of priests from Africa over here right now because they're so, they're so darn joyful and orthodox over there. They see, like, America is mission territory, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, it's kind of a joke, you know, it's, it's just, it's, so it's good because I would say, like, we, we need more priests like that. Like, keep sending us those, those priests. Tons of great priests here, don't get me wrong. But so he really affected me. And then another one, Father Arul, was a missionary priest from India. And his reverence when celebrating the mass. He was so just beautifully patient, very different style than Father Wilford. But Father Wilford is just absolutely exuberant, joyful, chanting. Father um, a rule from India, very kind of quiet, reserved, but just beautifully patient. Mm. And I love the diversity in the spiritual expressions. Now, not to mention the diversity in ethnicities. That's a beautiful thing too, yeah. that we're all Catholic. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter the color of your skin, your ethnicity, none of that. None of that matters. What matters is our core central shared belief in God's love for us yeah. and God sharing himself through the Eucharist. And so I love, I love that to know that I could go anywhere around the world and that's always going to be shared. That's going to be a shared experience that I can dive into and how it brings humanity together under what is most important from all aspects of the world. Yeah. So I love that element of diversity, which to me seems the right, ele- the right way to think about diversity. And then the diversity in the spiritual expressions themselves and how many different spiritual orders there are and different prayers and, you know, ways even of, liturgies of, between and the even East liturgies. and the West. And like, there's so many different, different liturgies. Yeah. Right. So I'm sorry, I'm blending, I'm blending loves oh, now because yeah. the original thing was priests. So the priests and just the other week was having kind of, you know, some, some, personal family issues that I'll spare the podcast listeners. I'm like, I need some counsel on this. And, and I've been so fortunate. I have so many good priest friends in my life that I could call a priest and I could tell them personal stuff that's going on. And, and I texted my, my priest friend and, um, and he's like, absolutely. Give me a call. Give me a call right now. Like he just cared, like, you know, mm. to take the time immediately. And it was so helpful in so many ways and the good, beautiful priests out there that have given their lives to being holy men, to tending the sheep, to caring for people's spiritual and physical needs, I cannot defend these people enough because unfortunately, because of the bad priests, there's just been this huge slandering of the priesthood. Yeah. And that is so unfair uh, to, to the vast, vast, vast majority of good, holy men who give their lives to God and the love of neighbor. I love our Catholic priests and they've, they've changed me and helped me in so many ways that I'll, I'll never be able to repay that, but I can at least maybe try to pay some of it forward. Yeah. And going along with that, I I love the concreteness of the church as far as, you know what? I, I, I've misheard God's voice personally for me, like so many times it's not even funny, but what I take great comfort in being Catholic is there's an external form to discernment. So like a few years ago, I was discerning the priesthood actually for myself. And I had a meeting with Bishop Olson of Fort Worth Diocese and um, Bishop Olson just said, 
you know, based on our chat and based on our, how he, how he knew the journey had been so far with discernment, he just said, Eric, the answer is no for you. The answer is no. Mm-hmm. And just that, and I was like, but I was feeling all these things like, what the heck, you know, what do I do with this? And he gave me great counsel with it. He was like, listen, you're called to be a saint. I'm just saying the priesthood is not the means for you. Something else is. And I said, okay, well, and I've wrestled with that because I'm like, but internally and then, but it was beautiful and it was refreshing actually to get a no, to get clarity. Mm-hmm. And I need that external form, that concreteness. And, I, and having a spiritual director during that whole time as well, having someone I can go to to say like, hey, here's what I'm hearing from God. What do you think about that? Right. Like, <laughs> am I off? And, and a huge help actually was St. Faustina, her diary and how Jesus even in her private visions with Jesus, Jesus told her, if I tell you something different than what your confessor says, listen to your confessor. Like, whoa, because he's like, I will work. I'm God. Like I can work through anyone. You know, that's the thing is he has a mystical union with the church. Right. And so, yes, like it's so beautiful to have like a check and a balance on our internal and personal relationship with God. Yeah. Cause feelings can be misleading. Yes. And the, and the devil's good at appearing like an angel of light and being very sneaky and you gotta be careful. And like, it's so comforting to be like, okay, here's what I'm hearing am I off or, or, or sometimes it's been like, here's what I'm getting. And it's like, go for it. Like, yes. Right. Yes. And it gives me more confidence going mm. forward. Like, okay, boom, like, let's go. Yeah. Um, because again, God isn't yeah. asking the impossible of us. He's not, he, right. he wouldn't ask us to decipher things that are so ambiguous. And that's yeah. part of the reason. And that ties directly into confession, right? Yeah. He wants us to have the assurance. He wants us to hear the words because we're physical creatures right. for sins are forgiven. That's right. a beautiful thing to me. And going al- exactly what yeah. you said. Yeah. And going along with what you said earlier about the Catholicity, like the diversity and unity of the church is phenomenal. I think this was most apparent to me a year after I became Catholic. I had the privilege of going on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, um, to Israel, and and it was amazing. And it was so cool because I saw people from all different nations, Indians, French people, um, the Chinese, like Africans, you know, everyone was there, like all these different groups. And they were all the ones, you know, that I saw, these are Catholic pilgrims going to these sites to worship God. And like, I went into a mass that was uh, by the French people and I knew what was going on. Yep. Um, And I, you know, I've been to Eastern liturgies as well, and which is totally different, but such an awesome experience and still the same basic form as far as liturgy of the Eucharist or liturgy of the word and then liturgy of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And so what a beautiful thing to have literally like all the prophecies in the old Testament, like even to Abraham, like through you, all the nations will be blessed, which is fulfilled in Christ. The one offspring that's being fulfilled right here, right now through the Catholic church. It's the universal church, right? It's, it's already gathering every tongue, every people, every nation and worshiping the one God through Jesus Christ. And so what an amazing thing that, we are part of this thing that has been building and building since the beginning. It's the plan of salvation God has for mankind and to be part of that. And just once again, going back to the humility, it's humbling to be like, why did you invite me to this? Like, thank you. (laughs) How did I get into this this. party? Yeah. (laughs) And like, I have a small part to play in the grand scheme of things, but it's fun to be a part of it and to play it, you know? Right. There's a beautiful book. Uh, maybe fit, Eric, we should just make this an intermittent series because there's so much we could do. Yeah. So I think this needs to have like a part million to it, but we'll just, yeah. we'll just like stagger it in every so often because it's, it's good to return to, I think, these personal yes. and beauty yes. aspects. There's a book by Thomas Howard. He's a convert to the Catholic Church from an evangelical background as well. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, Eric. Uh, no. Beautiful writer. So even if you just like beautiful writing, he's a mm. well-known uh, uh writer and uh, professor of the English uh, language. So he's, he's worth it just for his, his writing style. But he's got a book called On Being Catholic. And I would commend that to anybody. Um, it's, not just, it's not just articulate in its defense of the Catholic faith, but it's so beautifully written. He does such a good job of bringing out the beauty. That's one of those hidden gem books that I wish people wow. knew more about on being Catholic by Thomas Howard. So, okay. um, yeah, I'll leave people with that. Cause Eric, I know we could go for hours and we hours. Could. So what do yeah. you think about making this uh, kind of intermittent? On I love that. Cause yeah. it's so important and refreshing. Honestly, this has been such a refreshing conversation for me. Just like, 
to think about and to uh, just cherish the beauty that we experience. It's, I'm I'm excited to go to Mass again. My goodness, like get me there. Yeah, yeah. No, that's the beautiful thing. And I like I'm talking with two friends right now uh, who are seriously, you know, they're they're probably going to become Catholic, you know, here, you know, so let's keep praying because they, they're, they're, they're both uh, leading in that direction. Mm. Um, but one of the things that was interesting to them um, of all the things they could have picked is they're like, I think it's really cool that I could go to mass every day. Yes. And I'm like, it is, <laughs> it yes. is really cool. I mean, oh. and that's, that's one of those things that like was such a painful thing about this, this whole pandemic. There's a lot of painful things about the yeah. pandemic was losing that daily mass experience. Now yeah. we, yeah, I think we did the best we could. We streamed uh, father uh, uh, Bishop Robert Barron uh, and Word of Fire does a beautiful streaming, you know, mm -hmm. and you can do the prayers and the, you can follow along with the liturgy, but yeah, get it. You miss out on that tangible, physical, sacramental experience. So yeah. Um, I've always appreciated daily mass, but sometimes, you know, you can appreciate it even more once it's taken away for a little bit. Yeah. But it's such a wonderful thing to be able to every day. And it's yeah. so good because the world is insane Give in so this... many different ways. Yes. And to just have that time every day to just go and just, like you said, Eric, just be taken up into, into really a glimpse of heaven, of heaven on earth. That's what yeah. the mass is. It's heaven meeting earth. And just be restored and refreshed. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'll end on that. Yes. Well, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, yeah, if you're Catholic, feel free to share, um, whether with us or just with your friends. You know, what do you love about being Catholic? If you're not Catholic, then hey, like, come and check it out. Like, it's beautiful. I know sometimes it doesn't look like that from the outside. Like that was my perception is that can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from the Catholic church? The answer is yes, Jesus. Yeah. And it's amazing. And like, it's the old analogy of like, when you look at a cathedral from the outside and the stained glass windows, it just looks dark and dim and just ugly. But from the inside, when you see the light peering in through the stained glass, it lights up and it's this beautiful mosaic. Mm -hmm. and this beautiful stained glass and that's what it's like it's like whoa i i think for me one of the most refreshing parts and once again we could go on and on but i'll end with this pet i feel like the gospel has just come to life in a whole new way that i could never have foreseen mm -hmm. and i'm more in love with jesus today than i was before and i hope that's always true and and i just thank the lord for allowing me to be catholic uh, so that I could know him in these ways. And it's so beautiful. And I just can't express that love enough. So enough with words. Let, 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 well, for me, gonna, for me. Yeah, you words. go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, two things. So two recommendations. If you're not Catholic, just check out that book, but also check out uh, the Catholicism series by Bishop yeah. Robert Barron. So beautiful. So well done. I actually won a couple of awards, I think, when it was on PBS originally. Just check it out. Just watch it. I think, yeah. Yeah, I think no matter where you're coming from, I think you'll, you'll enjoy just the pro sheer production of it, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, and then if you are Catholic, I, I would love to hear your, your take. So, so email, email Eric, or if you listen to my show, email me, Pat Flynn, the Chronicles of Strength, and tell me why you love being Catholic. And Eric, maybe next time we do an episode like this, we could share some of them. Yes. Come in. So we'd love yes. To and my email is eric at polycarpsparadigm.com. Cool. So, well, thanks everyone. God bless.